everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemmler. Our next guest is the hilarious actor and writer Thomas Lennon, who you may know from Reno 911, Night at the Museum, A Feudal and Stupid Gesture, The Odd Couple, and of course, Terrence Malick's Night of Cups. I did that for you. Now he's tackling children's books with the first of his Ronan Boyle series, Ronan Boyle and the Bridge of Riddles. Please welcome Thomas Lennon. Let's hear it. Thank you. So I have the craziest thing to say to start this. Yes. I, I love your career. I, oh, thank you. I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, but I love watching. Like, I was a fan of the state when I was in middle school. Mm -hmm. And to be able to watch so many of you sort of twist and turn and pivot and do all of these different things with your career that just seem to be what you're interested in. It's, it's legitimately eerie how many people from the state like went on to success in different things. Like Michael Showalter <clears throat> directed uh, The Big Sick. Yeah. Uh, David Wayne has done All the Wet Hot American Summers. Michael Ian Black, of course, from the state. Uh, I'm, I'm talking with tonight at the NYU Bookstore. <clears throat> it, it was- uh, Also written children's books, I believe, as well. also written children's books. And not only that, two members of the state, Kevin Allison and Michael Showalter, were held by security when this building used to be a Tower Records. Why was that? For shoplifting cassettes. <laughs> cassettes was something we used to have, kids. Um, but so... Uh, Are they together or separately? Totally separate oh, okay. incidents. Okay. Totally separate incidents. But uh, they both, everyone, they've gone on to great things. Yeah. Uh, despite uh, shoplifting here at Tower Records. So what do you owe this kind of success? Is it just your own curiosity in terms of being a writer? Like, now I'm going to write big comedy movies, or now I'm going to go back to a form of sketch, or now I'm going to do a book? I think the... For me, the secret is there's a lot of aspects of movie writing that can make you that can drive you crazy, and there's certainly aspects of acting that are frustrating because you're waiting around forever. And so I think early on when we were in the state, and this is something that I just still hold true, is I just don't wait for opportunities. Right. Uh, I don't wait for someone to give permission to do something. So. Uh, it ends up keeping you, you end up, if you can diversify the things that you're interested in, it will uh, cushion the blow of when you have like heartbreaks of, you know, movies, uh, you can write 10 movies to get one made. Right, you have, and that would be a pretty good ratio, actually. Yeah. You have probably like, what, seven or eight movies at this point that have gotten made? Maybe, maybe a couple more than that. And how By the many... way, <clears throat> of those, two or three were good. <laughs> how many have you written, though? Films? Yeah. Uh, that have been plays. made probably about a dozen, which means that Ben Garant and I have written probably at least 50 scripts. That's incredible. Over the years. Yeah. <clears throat> which most of which did not see the light of day. But that's, you know, it's, you also can't get too torn up about that. It's part of the process, you know. Um, and, you know, sometimes like we came into Night of the Museum, we were very lucky. We, we got to write Night of the Museum, which was a very short children's book. But we got that job because we had written a movie called Taxi with Queen Latifah and Jimmy Fallon <clears throat> that was an epic disaster. I remember. It was such a huge flop, but we had already signed a deal to write Taxi 2. So we came into the studio and they're like, well, obviously there'll be no Taxi 2. <laughs> but can you, make a, can you make a movie out of this book, Night at the Museum, this like children's book, which we did. So, you know, I, if you can press on through your disappointments, sometimes there's pot of gold there, yeah. And now was Ronan Boyle uh, an idea that came from pressing on from a disappointment or an idea that came from downtime? Or was it something that was born out of, you know, we like we said in the green room, you have a nine-year-old child right now. Mm -hmm. Most likely I'm sure you're reading to him children's books at times. I am, and I also think I, that I wrote a book that was definitely geared to when I started to love reading, which was right around when I read um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm. And... I realized that you could have fantasy that's also really funny. Um, and also uh, like Kurt Vonnegut books. So I, I wrote this book probably not only for like my son, who's nine, but to like just a younger me the who would want to read funny fantasy, which is probably my favorite genre. An indoor kid. Indoor kids. <laughs> indoor kids with weak wrists. I was an indoor Knees. kid as well. Pop yeah. That, yes. Uh, one of the things that I love about the book is that uh, there are also references and things in it that are for an adult that sure. are specifically, I think, for you. I was, I was saying to you 
before uh, the kid's favorite movie, Ronan's favorite movie is a Swedish film, Swedish, mm-hmm. right, called My Life as a Dog. Oh, yes, one of the saddest movies you'll ever... If you can get through My Life as a Dog and not weep, check, because you might be a robot. <laughs> it's one of the saddest films ever made. But uh, there's definitely lots of aspects of Ronan's personality are just based on me. His fake face gets pink when he's uh, stressed out. He has food allergies. He is obsessed. Wait, is my with life as a dog, your favorite movie? It is absolutely. Oh yeah. Do you wa- do you watch it occasionally? No, because you will just you'll sit and cry all the time. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. We have a bunch of like I have a bunch of those movies too that are just like that's my favorite movie. It's the most powerful experience. Oh, I've but I can't watch it. Never. No, I can't watch it. Can't watch it. It'll, it just rips me apart. Yeah. And uh, his his best friend or who he spends a lot of time with is Dame Judi Dench. In his mind, whenever Ron mind gets uh, when he starts to get panic, oh, because he also has claustrophobia, which I also have, which is fun. Um, when he gets claustrophobic or panicked or allergic or stressed out, he. <laughs> He has a, a Dame Judi Dench that lives in his head, that who, who sort of is his kind of like his interior Jiminy Cricket, I guess. How did yeah. um, so? How, how does an idea like this come to you? I, I know that that's like a cliche question. Where do you get this idea? I don't necessarily mean it that way. Like, are you writing something else? Do you journal every day, and ideas end up coming to you? Or no, this one was this one was very specific. This one was, um, and this very seldom happens because I, I thought for like twenty ish years, like, hey, maybe I'll write a novel. But um, that's a little harder than it sounds. And I was in Ireland, and I, I, really hard. I, I ended up looking at, um, someone showed me on a wall what uh, Ronan carries a, a shillelagh, which all the, all the police officers of the special unit. So he's in the unit that, that is just crimes of leprechauns. And um, someone showed me a real, like, fighting shillelagh. And as soon as I saw the shillelagh on the wall, like, most of the concept of the book came to me in, in like, a minute. Which was weird. Then, of course, it took uh, well over a year to write out the idea that I had, but yeah. the concept was instantaneous just from looking at this shillelagh on the wall. You know, um, just a, a question as a as, as an artist. You know, David Lynch has this quote about the idea that, like, you know, you hope you're mo- you have this idea for your movie, and you hope that while you're making it or you're writing it, you're never stretching too far from that original idea. Hearing that you had this all this concept, and then it took a year for that concept to come to fruition, is that year spent a lot of the time making sure that you're staying true to the concept or staying close to it and not pulling too far away? Uh, that is such a great point because especially on movies that often happens where you're like, this is the idea. And then by the time you get done, you've drifted so far away from that. With, the, with Ronan Boyle, I actually feel like uh, all that happened in the year that I wrote it and then I took it to Abrams and there's an amazing editor there, Maggie, who basically just picked some places to make it more of a compelling novel. Mm-hmm. I think I'd started off as sort of a funny novel um, and ended up becoming more of more of a page turner than also. So it's a fun now it's a funny page turner. Were yeah. you always a writer growing up? No, I never wrote at all in fact and I came to New York uh, in 1988 and my intention was to be like a very serious Broadway actor. Like, I just assumed that I'd be in, like, Les Mis and things like that. Were you a musical uh, actor? Mm, a little bit, yeah. In high school, I did some musicals. And uh, then I got to New York and I realized, oh, I'm, I'm just a goofball. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'll probably never be taken seriously for the rest of my life. And that was fine. It's, it's actually kept me very busy. What made you realize that you were a goofball? I don't know. I guess n- everyone else laughing when I would be very serious. <laughs> There's definitely that. Uh, But so, yeah, so I got to New York, and actually right across the street from here, uh, I joined the comedy group called The State. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to uh, do anything in the show, you just had to write. So we wrote all our own material, and obviously the people that wrote the most stuff, you could get, get the most screen time. So it became mostly a... Survival of the fittest. And when the state ended, did you know that you wanted to keep writing? I mean, sometimes once you start writing and know that you can do it, it's hard to ever, it's hard to stop. It becomes a muscle that you have to work out. That was interesting because I had done, uh, we did uh, the state, and then we did a show called Viva Variety. That's right. And then um, while we were doing Viva Variety. So what was Mike Lee and Black's, Johnny Blue Jeans? Johnny Blue Jeans. Hey, you're a cool ass pal, Johnny Blue Jeans. Um, So that. while we were doing that show, we had been uh, asked by Michael Patrick Jan, also from the state, he said, could you uh, adapt this book into a movie, which ended up being called Let's Go to Prison. Mm. 
one of our many flops. It was directed by Bob Odenkirk. Well, that didn't get directed, though, until many years later, right? Uh, it was a couple years later, not, oh, okay. not that long ago. It was one of our earlier pieces. But basically what happened there has been the other part of our career. Someone said to me and Ben, they said, could you write a movie of this book? To which we said, oh, absolutely, of course. Now, we had never read a movie script or any book about screenwriting, <laughs> and we knew nothing about it. So we just wrote the funniest script that we could write. Um, which then, of course, turned into the classic, let's go to prison. What happened yeah. there? Which, <laughs> you know, this is what often, this is what often happens. You, uh, we wrote the script, which people loved. Uh, it got made, and everybody liked it. Made uh, fairly close to the script? Stuck the first draft was, the first cut of the movie was pretty close to the script, and then it turned out that it tested well. Like, people liked it a little bit in test screenings, because they test studio movies. Yeah. And, uh... Since it tested well, they thought, well, now let's make it like a big hit. Mm. So they reshot about a third of the movie, wow. making it sort of bigger and more fun and stuff like that. And then by the time I saw the movie, I brought like 25 people to Universal City to see the movie, and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. And I just sat there thinking, what happened? But sometimes that'll, that'll happen in the movie business. Yeah. yeah. And that's and you well, had. Well, that's the other the other reason that I got, it was great to get into books, which is the book beginning to end, every word in the book is my full expression of my sensibility. So. And now, when you sat down and decided to write the book, you saw the concept. Mm -hmm. It came to you. It took you about a year to write. Mm -hmm. Do you have a a routine when it comes to writing? Are you a wake up in the morning and write right away? The secret, if you want to write. I hate to say it, it is a volume yep. business. I mean, you, you simply must do it all the time. Uh, and the reason is because you're gonna throw so much of it away. Uh, you, it, just, it just, statistically, you, um, I think everybody at some point probably has the same amount of like really great material in them. Um, but that'll be probably about a quarter of what you write. <laughs> so. If you're if you're generating lots and lots of stuff, it's, it sounds like a silly thing to say, but I find for me, if I'm writing a ton, the odds of some of it turning out well is better. So you wake up every morning and go go start writing, I've, basically. I've written every day since I started writing in probably 1989. I've written certainly every day. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so so once you started writing for the state, you were like, I am a writer. I wake up and I write every day. Yes, yeah, and either it's either wake up or it's, but it, definitely at some point. Even when you're on set? Even, uh, there's an almost no better time than when you're on, oh my gosh, there's really exciting kung fu happening upstairs. Um, uh, one of the great times to write, if you're, especially if you're a character actor, is on downtime in movies. It's, oh my gosh, yeah. Movies, movies happen very slowly sometimes, yeah. Um, has your son read the book? My son has, I've read the book to him. Did you like book, it? Uh, he did like it very much. My nephew, who's a, a faster reader, uh, Loved it. I, the book is dedicated to my son, and I, I waited a long time to tell him that. I thought it would be really exciting. And he's a little bit of a goofball, so I opened him up the book, and I said, do you see that it says, for Oliver? And he literally went like this. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I genuinely thought, like, I thought we would both be crying. Oh, kids are the greatest thing kids in the world. Kids are the greatest thing in the world. Because they, re they remind you once in a while, like, yeah, you're not so great. Shut up, stupid. Hey, oh, stupid. Great, you're oh, right. wow. Yeah. That was it. That was it. <laughs> and did you feel like, was there a certain part of you that was like, there we go, a year, I, I put a year into this moment, and, the, and I, I know, didn't I thought it would it. be more amazing. I was like, tell your mother that I did this. Yeah. Uh, At the same time, it is pretty, a pretty amazing moment. It's almost it better than It was an amazing moment, but I think, with, like a lot of amazing moments with kids, they will only realize it much, much later. Don't you think? Like, you didn't realize, in your childhood, you don't realize, like, wow, these people are really cool. And doing oh, it so goes much up until me. the teenage years. No. Yeah. You're just like, shut up. Mm -hmm. You're boring. Yeah. Yeah. And then later on, you love them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like 34, and I have moments all the time where I'm like, oh, I do this nice oh, thing wow. for people because my parents did a nice thing for me when yeah. I was a teenager. And I told them to fuck off. <laughs> yeah. during the At the time, I was just leaning out the upstairs window smoking cigarettes, being like, I'll be down in a minute. <laughs> shut up. I'm not smoking. Hmm? I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> Ask dad. <laughs>
Um, so you sit, you take a year to write this book. How long does it usually take you and Ben to write screenplays? This is interesting. Uh, the the secret to writing a screenplay, and it's so uh, tedious, is you must you have to outline it. Yeah. And if if it's carefully outlined, Ben and I now, when we're writing a movie, will write an outline that's about 25 pages long, mm -hmm. maybe 30 pages. It's just a very detailed, like a, a novella of what everything that's going to happen in the movie. Once you've written an outline, writing is a joy because then it's just the fun of figuring out what happens next. But if you haven't outlined, that's when you get stressed and it feels like a chore. So uh, movies, uh, if you're writing a movie, I think the outline should take several months probably. And then the actual script could take a couple weeks if you if you've outlined it carefully, and that part will be a joy. Yeah. yeah. And with this, it takes. Do you do you didn't feel like you had to outline first? You know, the first book I didn't. Uh, I let it unfold as it was happening, but that was because I had the I had the joy, uh, the luxury of I had no deadline at all. So for the second book, which I've just finished uh, in this series. Uh, I, I had to have a slightly more careful outline. It's a little more expansive. And, Do you mm -hmm. feel like you need a writing partner for movies or television, but it's easier to write alone with, with, a, with a book? Um, like, did you miss having a writing partner for, for, for Ronan Boyle? Well, uh, no, this is fun because it's, um, it's the really unfiltered version of my sense of humor. Not, ben and I, um, one thing about our partnership for movies is he's incredible with like structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I get a little bit silly sometimes, but he, so this book is, has a lot of silliness in it, I will say that. Um, oh, you're the guy that, you're the, you're the guy in the movies or like who, mm -hmm. in writing the movies, who has the joke that may pull, pull people out of the concept oh, as yeah. a whole. Like you oh. wanna make fun of everything. And he has to be like, that no, is, that is that's occasionally gonna go true. too far. I've seen my canon of, you know, $240 worth of pudding and yeah. monkey torture. And Porcupine Racetrack. Porcupine Torture is really great. My, occasionally, I, I, I skew towards nonsense. But my favorite, yeah. my favorite line in the Monkey Torture sketch was always, he's going to come on and show us uh, about little edible luggage. <laughs> I forgot that is a, a line that was actually written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the final Chef, moment. Was it Chef Paul Burdell was going to show us about <laughs> little edible luggage? Mm, yeah, yeah, that does like, sound good. It does sound good. Yeah. Um, yeah. For state heads out there. Wow, that's a deep cut. Yeah. I will say, what I do like about Ronan Boyle, mm -hmm. though, was that there is an element of that sense of humor consistently throughout. I think it's what you mean by you unfiltered. There is always a joke and always a silly moment, and you are always sort of stretching the line of how much the story, how, how much you can keep the reader in the story while at the same time kind of, I would never say poking fun at it, but making right. jokes, making silliness. with. But uh, I, I think that that is uh, probably the, like, the telltale thing that goes through my whole career, which is... How serious and dramatic can you be when something very silly is happening? Because even in like in Reno 911, that was basically my bit is like, I'm in the shorts, but in my mind, I'm Gregory Peck, you know? So like I, that, again, with Ronan Boyle too, that's like, si there are some very silly things in it, but the stakes occasionally are, are really life and death. And uh, there's a lot of adventure too. You know, yeah. I loved uh, Reno 911 so much. I thought that show was really great. Is there ever any? Is there ever a chance that you guys would bring it back or those characters back? Or I, do you I can't miss imagine doing it? at some point? I I certainly don't miss wearing the shorts. <laughs> when I would do the show, it was one of those things that you would find later. Did you ever uh, like if you've like walked through like like uh, thorns or something? Every night when I would come home from Reno 911, if you take a shower, you don't realize all the cuts you have on your body until soap hits them. And every single day, I was just like covered in just cuts from Why? the legs. Cuts, it was, I was always being like wrestled. Nick Swartzen would wrestle me. Or there's somebody would throw gravel at me. But it was, it was a great, great job. It was the lowest paying job that I got the most injured on in my life. <laughs> Yeah. So much of that show, I mean, I know it wasn't in all of it. was I, It wasn't all improvised, but you would go in with a concept often and the, you guys would just kind of literally fight it out. <laughs> this is a, that's a major not really secret about Reno 911 is that it feels very improvised, but we actually, 
there was a very specific outline for almost everything that we did. Um, the few exceptions being Nick Swartzen as Terry, who's the guy who'd go pew, pew, uh, and a couple of other pieces. But everything we always knew uh, sort of the main structure of things, and we definitely knew like what is the ending. Because mm. if you don't know, if you don't have something you're working towards, it can just get real messy sometimes. You know, I, yeah. I saw, uh, well, two things. Um, in the, about the author here, for some reason, one of your mentions is, as well as the music video for Weird Al Yankovic's Foil. I was really proud of <laughs> It says he's been a cast in many television mm -hmm. and films, mm -hmm. as well as Weird Al Yankovic's music video. <laughs> <laughs> it was the one credit that I wanted to get in. And I, I so... I, Wikipedia also says that you're very close friends with him. I don't know who added that recently. It is definitely Weird true. Al, maybe? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if he says in White and Nerdy that he edits Wikipedia, but... Uh, I knew yeah, like he's we're good friends. I knew that was going to be the only real credit that I put in my about the author, and I was really excited because then I, I want I showed it to Weird Al, and I was like, hey, I just want to show you this is my actual bio. It says Tom Lennon's been in some movies and films, and the video for Weird Al Yankovic's foil, <laughs> and uh, he he went like this. He didn't cry, but he did do that. Oh, I'm kind of crying gesture. How long have yeah. you known him? I met, uh, I met Weird Al probably about 12 years ago in a Staples office supplies on a Sunday morning. <laughs> we were both looking at printer toner. I said, are you Weird Al Yankovic? He said, are you Lieutenant Dangle? I said, yes. I said, should we just decide to be best friends? And then we did. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you guys see each other regularly? And All the time. Like, I'm at the point in my life where I'm like, I spend a lot of time texting with Weird Al. <laughs> it's like a dream. Yeah, I bet he just mm -hmm. makes you happy. Oh, he's one, he's the, one of the finest people you'll ever meet in your life. Yeah. It's a, he's a joy to be around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a uh, one question from the audience. Who has a question in, the, in this audience here? Hey, you, sir. How you Hi. Doing? What's going on, Thomas? Congrats on the book. I want to ask about uh, your experience on I Love You, Man. Is Doug... And in the great words, it was a taste of betrayal. Can you tell us about that? Taste of betrayal. Peter, you're a whore. That's one of my most quoted uh, lines is, um, you're a whore, Peter, from I Love You, Man. So uh, in I Love You, Man, I play Doug, who goes on a, a date with Paul Rudd. And Paul thinks it's just to be like best friends, but I think it's a date. And at the end, I, I kiss him for a long time. We were actually nominated for an MTV Best Kiss Award for that scene. Thank you very much. Do they still do those? I don't know. Do the they movie awards? Do the MTV Movie Awards still? They exist? used to do Best Kiss, and I know because I was up for it. Who won? I won? Twilight. I thought so. I was gonna say, yeah. Those bastards from Twilight. They own that award for they about own five that. Years. They oh, you could not touch the Twilight kids. For kissing, that was it. Was a funny. Now, here's a totally true story. So, we actually filmed that scene not far from my house in Los Angeles. So, um, I, I had not told. I told my wife I was in the movie, but I didn't tell her like what that there was a long scene where I was going to kiss Paul Rudd on the street. So she came out to just walking the dog to see how how the shoot was going, and I was out on the street, big lights everywhere, kissing Paul Rudd. And Hamburg, John Hamburg, the director, made us do, for some reason, he made us do like 40 takes of that. Just over and over, soft kisses, open mouth kisses. That's why we got the nomination, obviously. Um, and so I, I, at one point, I could just feel I was kissing Paul Rudd, and I could see out of the corner of my eye, I'm like, hey, that's my wife over there. And I haven't yet told her about this scene. <laughs> and now it's weird, because why didn't I mention it? You know, now it's like, I was like, she was, I was just like, oh, I just figured you'd be cool. Me and Paul just kissing on the corner for a while. There's, and then there's no way out. You're just in like a weird hole that you've dug yourself into. Yeah. Well, there's like an inherent laziness in being a, a man sometimes. Where it's like, if I tell her, then I got to talk about it. Oh, I then it's a, whole it. it's like a whole thing. Yeah, exactly. But it's not a whole thing. You've just made it a whole thing now. Yeah. And then the fact that I hadn't said anything about it made it really a whole thing. It was, that was very weird. Anyway, we lost the award. But I would like to thank the nice people at the, like, it's called, like, Nivea, the lip. Oh, yeah, lip. The, yeah. I got, like, a case of Nivea for being uh, lip stuff for being nominated for uh, Best Kiss Award. <laughs> so there's almost a year that I didn't buy ChapStick. 
Um, you know, also when I was reading Just your saying, Wikipedia, ain't bragging if it's true. When I was reading your Wikipedia, I, mm. I didn't realize. I mean, as a fan of the state and having been a fan for since I was a a little kid, uh, I didn't realize that you and Carrie Kenny knew have known each other since high school. I met Carrie Kenny on the the very first day that I went to theater camp. Uh, at North, it was called Cherubs at Northwestern University. So yeah, we've been uh, very good friends since 1987. That puts so. Froggy Jamboree into a whole new perspective. Froggy Jamboree, there's an, yet another uh, through line to a lot of my sketches with the state. Porcupine Racetrack, Froggy Jamboree, is that they're uh, Monkey Torture, which was a backup sketch. Was They were sketches that people did not originally want to do. Well, Froggy Jamboree has the line in it, you guys do whatever the hell you want. That's right. <laughs> it's in the credits. That, and it was in the credits. And we did Froggy Jamboree. Wow. Was that something that, uh, did you and Carrie originate a lot of material together? Was that someone that you had worked with for? We because did, you... and then we would go on to do, of course, uh, Viva Variety together and Reno. Reno 911 together. And in between that, we actually did like two other pilots oh, wow. that didn't go. Uh, one was a really fun show that we did called Hey Neighbor, which was like a sitcom. Michael Ian Black and uh, his wife had been put in the witness relocation program and moved to this like weird town in Southern Illinois, but six people played the whole town. So it was like sort of a sketch show. It was a little like, sort of like Little Britain kind of thing. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of like in between TV failures. Reno 911 was a failed TV show. Reno 911 we shot for Fox in 2000 and they passed. Yeah, it was just not for them and it sat on the shelf for about three years. Three years. Except for three years, and then we and then we did it again for Comedy Central. What were you guys? What were you doing for three years while this show that you had put together was on the shelf? We were endlessly trying other TV shows. In fact, at, at that point, we wrote um, we wrote a sketch show for Fox, uh, and we had written Ben and I had written so many sketches that we were really really proud of, and we got canceled at the table read. We literally got together and like read all the sketches for Fox, and they were like, nah. They're like, oh, that was really funny, but no, we're not going to do a TV show of this. And then we... At yeah. the table read? Yes, yes. These things happen sometimes. Like, ju like you had yeah. just finished doing the table read? We, they, you had fairness, even... they kind of sat around for a couple minutes, and then they're like, okay, guys, yeah, we're not going to do this. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Yeah. That's a tough business. When did you become, um, I don't want, I, know, I, I doubt you're numb to this, but mm -hmm. when did you get sort of just used to this happening and you were kind of like, okay with, okay, that, that happened, let's pick up the pieces and do something else now? You know, it takes a long time to get used to that because the first couple times where you, you know, have a movie that doesn't work or the script that doesn't get picked up, you know, it, it, it can start to break your heart, but Imagine the first time was probably the Halloween special for CBS, right? So we, we for some reason, the state, yes, we left MTV. which had, giving you the keys to the castle. They just offered us 65 more guaranteed episodes on the air. And we were like, no, nah, no, we're going to take three specials at CBS, which CBS offered us three specials. We shot one of them. They offered them. you a whole season. No, 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 no. They offered us three specials. We shot one of them, which... The ratings were so historically low. All I remember is, that, so the morning after the CBS Halloween special, we had gone in to start working on our second special. It was very close to Halloween, so Carrie Kenny and I had gotten into our underwear down the hall and wrapped ourselves in toilet paper to look like mummies. And we came into like the conference room where everybody was sitting going, <laughs> and as because we were underwear mummies, you know, we were just doing bits. And as we came in to scare everyone else in the room, uh, we were told, Shh, Shh, CBS is on speakerphone, they're canceling us right now. So Carrie and I were in our underwear wrapped in toilet paper, <laughs> and then we had to like sit down and like act like we were at a normal meeting. Like, that's incredible. Like, oh, have, yeah, how have you not used that in something? Yeah. That's such a great scene. <laughs> no, I know. And then, but, you know, it becomes, yeah. After you get canceled like six or eight times off TV, you, you start to forget which one was which. Yeah. And so at this point, if you write a movie, if you write a pilot, if you, and it doesn't go, you kind of know how to just be like, okay, well, let's move on. You know, I mean, you just have to keep pressing on. And, and that's the other thing is that so many times I've also learned that things that don't work out the first time come tend to come back around. I mean, the three-year wait on Reno 911 
which is now the thing that I'm, you know, the most known for, basically. Yeah. Uh, that was just, um, the overnight successes tend to take, you know, There's about no a, such thing as an overnight well, success. Well, yeah, right? they, did, they just take about a decade. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what it took for mm. for you. Well, for you, right? I mean, if you would if you would say that your biggest success, I mean, you're you most known for Reno, but your biggest success may be Night at the Museum. That's about 10, 15 years of of working and writing until you. Oh, found absolutely, that. absolutely, yeah. Uh, and that's the other thing is you just you're endlessly when things are working and not working. It's just also remember that you might you are getting better at it. You know, hopefully. Sometimes. Is it hard to remember that that's actually the, the most important part? Uh, is it the most important no, part? I guess or not. Giant as soon as I said opening that, I was weekend like, box office. Right. I was going to say like. Making the bestseller list. That obviously. or like being able and to And the approval theater. of random strangers. I mean, just approval from, <laughs> from just like literally anybody. Just like make me feel like I did good. <laughs> that's the most important part. Have you started getting that yet with uh, with Ronan Boyle? Yeah, I, I will say uh, it's nice. It, it's uh, I'm trying to. Uh, it's the best reviewed thing I've, I've ever written, which has been really a, a joy. Um, Have you told Ben that? No. I, <laughs> he knows. He and I have an entire. The only other thing that was uh, got good reviews was our screenwriting book, which actually got good reviews. Yeah. Yeah, but um, the 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 book has gotten some nice write ups, and it does. It certainly has felt pretty good. So. Well, it's really funny. It's a it's an incredible job. It's out on shelves today, right? It's called Ronan Boyle it's and everywhere. the Bridge of Riddles, uh, written by you, Thomas Lennon, illustrated by John Hendricks. I, I, w I would be remiss if I didn't. Uh, there's a, Barnes and Noble has an edition that is uh, has the trainees manual in the back, so it's it's kind of a also a fun edition if you can get your hands on it. Amazing, Thomas Lennon, everybody, let's hear it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>